Um, one of the things that I'm sure you, you realize is that you work with children. Some of you have How many of you have children? Okay, there's a lot of you, so you probably will relate to this, because I know your children will naturally have that, um, that selfish tendency, right? I mean, you, you didn't teach your children how to be selfish, but they do have uh, a selfish tendency. Uh, you know, what's mine is mine, right? You have that, you see that attitude in uh, children, and what's yours is mine, and whatever I want is mine, yeah? Yeah. Have you ever heard of the toddlers, the toddlers' rules? Ever heard of the toddlers' rules? I'll, I'll give you the ten. Okay. Number one is this: if I want it, it's mine. Right? That's what you see. Number, number, number two: now, if it's in my hand, <laughs> then it's mine. <laughs> Nobody can get it from me, but that's mine. That's toddlers' rules. If I can take it away from you. It's mine, <laughs> right? Uh, Ford one. How many of you have seen this before? No? Okay, some of you have seen this. Number four, if, it ha if, if I had it just a little while ago, then it's definitely mine. Okay, even if it's yours, it's mine. Number five, if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. So that's just, that's just mine. All mine. Number six, uh, Number six is what? Number, number six is skipped. So let's go to seven then. <laughs> seven, if it just looks like mine, it's mine. Number six was taken away by the toddler. Number eight, <laughs> let's look at number eight. If I think it's mine, it's mine. Number nine is if I give it to you and change my mind later, it's still mine. And the, and the number 10 is, once it's mine, it'll never belong to anyone else, no matter what. It's mine. <laughs> and I'm sure, even when you all were, you were toddlers, you've probably gone through that kind of, a, that kind of an attitude. Um, it's a natural tendency, natural uh, selfishness continues with, with children. But you know what? We as adults, we do the same thing. Sure we do. And sometimes we do it in subtle ways. And, and, and it, we, we protect our stuff. Right? You know, not, not, nothing is more annoying or irritating when someone borrows something from you and then never gives it back to you. Or you, you have your price like a tool uh, from the garage and someone got it and misplaced it, and you, you get mad. Yeah, we, we try to protect our stuff. No, no, no. It, it's, uh, let me ask you this. How many, how many, how, how much of your giving really depends on your own personal happiness and comfort? You follow what I'm thinking here? You see, I, I'm more than willing to give just so long as it doesn't affect, you know, my finances. I'm willing to, to, to serve as long as it doesn't inconvenience me. So I'm, well, I'm always willing to help, you know, as long as it doesn't interfere with any of the thing, activities that I do. Uh, we, think, uh, we think like that sometimes. And, and we are a society that is obsessed with self-absorption, um, centered, self-centeredness. And, and selfishness. And we sometimes buy to that idea that it's, it's me, 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 all the time. The me first attitude. Y'all believe that? Yes. yes, there's two of you who believe that. Let, let me try to convince the others. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to have some stuff, but it's another thing to be uh, owned by the stuff that you have. And that's not what we see in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts chapter 4, there's always that kind of, it's, it's a community that has a self-sacrificial spirit. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to open in the book of Acts chapter 4. That's what we're going to be working on today. And let me just tell you this. For those of you who are tuning with us for the first time, those of you who are just uh, worshiping with us, 
visiting with us. We're going through the series. It's called, everybody, Truth, Truth Matters. It's a book about, a uh, uh, book of Acts, and it's about the, uh, the power and the works of the uh, apostle. But really, actually, I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit, if you really think about it. Um, but um, in, the, in this, in this, uh, uh, in this series, a few weeks ago, we started in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. Chapter 1, uh, let me just give you a rundown. Let me give you a review of what we've taken so far. Chapter 1, this is uh, what happens. In chapter 1, Christ ascended, right? Uh, at the end of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we all hear that story of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ uh, dying on the cross, and he resurrected. Now, continuation of that is in Acts, is in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, it recounts that Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. And then uh, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended. And it started the church. And when it started the church, there were only like 120 people. When the Holy Spirit started to uh, started to descend, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and, and Peter started uh, preaching, the 120 or 150, some people count, 150 of them, it swelled up to about how many? How many, tell me? 3,000 3, in just one day. In just one day. 120 that swelled up to 3,000. Um, and then in chapter 3, when all of these were happening, um, there were 3,000 that were gathering. And so the Sanhedrin, uh, the Sanhedrin actually uh, start noticing it. And then Peter and John uh, went to the temple, saw this lame man who was lame for about 40 years since birth. And he started healing the, the, the lame man. And he said, in the name of Christ, judge for yourself. Uh, in the name of Christ, rise up and walk. And then what happened was all the people were astonished. And then the church grew from 3,000 to 5,000. No, that's not 5,000. Because it's just 5,000 men. If you count even the women, probably there'll be more than that. It's 7,000, 10,000 easily. So the church was growing. They were on fire and fuego, right? The whole church was in a movement. Um, the people were believing. They were being baptized. And so it is. And then chapter 3, um, when, uh, or chapter 4, when the Sanhedrin, uh, those people who are the elite in the religious days, they saw what was happening. They got scared and jailed Peter and John. Peter and John. And then this is, what, this is what Peter said, judge not for yourselves whether it is right for you. Ha ha. It's not okay. Judge not for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. He was saying, uh, because they were actually trying to prevent him from preaching again this Christ and this resurrection. We don't believe in that. But Peter said, not going to happen. We're not going to obey you. We're going to obey God. Because God wants us to proclaim this. This is what we're going to do. So there were boldness. There was, bold, there was boldness in, in, in Peter. And in the book of Acts, that community, they had boldness as they uh, proclaimed the news of Jesus Christ. Uh, so then right after that in, uh, incident, we're... Now we're introduced another problem. Okay, imagine this. Um, <clears throat> I want you to think. From 120, became 3,000. From 3,000, we have 5,000, maybe even more, 7,000, things like that. Now, during that time, when this all happened, during the time of the Pentecost, people were gathering in that one place because of the, uh, of the festival. They were gathering in that place. But... But when that happened, it was assumed that the people after the festival, they'll go home, right? But people started believing. People started getting baptized. So now 3,000, they want to go home. 
5,000. They didn't want to go home. They were all gathering there. The church started. And so they didn't have any jobs. They didn't have any, they, they didn't have any place to, 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 to sleep for, for, or, or to stay for the, long, for the long haul. So there's a problem. And that's when we pick up on chapter 4 because the community that just started there, the community, the, 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 uh, the church of God that was birthed, started to uh, portray the, uh, uh, the characters of an ideal church. They started to become really generous. Uh, so the first thought I'd like to, to uh, well, so that's what we're going to be working on today because the early church met their need. And this week we're going to see, today uh, we're going to see how generous they are. So our title for this message is called Be Inexplicably Generous. Say that with me. Be Inexplicably Generous. Say that to the person next to you. That way you won't forget. Okay, encourage the person behind you and say, Be Inexplicably Generous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's get back to Jesus here. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Uh, we, ha we have this, this, this gathering that we have. They have this big gathering here in the Embassy Suites. So it's planned weeks ago. And we're following a series, right? And I said, okay, we're going to gear up with this, and we're going to invite people and stuff like this. And then, during the course of that planning, I've learned that, boy, the message that we're going to be having today would be on giving. And then my wife said, oh, no, people are, people are visiting, and might be thinking you, you're, going to be, you're going to be asking for money. And for a while there, I thought, Lord, why did you allow this, to, this message to be? I can preach on other stuff. This stuff, when it comes to money and when stuff to giving, is something that uh, I try to stay away from, really. If you know the people who are here in the church, who are here regularly, it's actually, uh, I preach on money only about maybe once in a year, maybe twice. And I think that's wrong because Jesus Christ preached money all the time. As a matter of fact, if you look at, at the sermons of Christ, a lot of it is, is tied up to finances and how where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. Um, but I, I don't want you to think that, that just because you're here as a visitor, we're trying to ask you for support or we're asking you to... To, uh, to give to the church? No, just uh, let the... Now I'm praying that the Spirit of God won't... Uh, uh, will give you another message, okay? Um, being generous. Being generous. Um, but let's see. Let's unpack this. The first thought I'd like you to see here is this one. Christ owns everything. Everybody say that. Christ owns everything. I own nothing. I own nothing. Christ owns everything. Uh, look at verse 32. Um, now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. You know, uh, some of the things that I've observed during the years, um, especially in working with children or I see children, whenever you give them a purpose in life or whenever you give them a sort of like a goal, they, they rarely fight. They start cooperating and it's... They, it, as a matter of fact, it becomes a competing kind of a, a game for them. If you give them a goal, give them something to do, uh, they all unite and they cooperate. Um, and that's the same thing with us, church. When we're pursuing a, a goal, um, we're most successful. As a matter of fact, you're most generous when you focus on our common goal. Focus on the purpose, why we're here. Look at verse 32 again. Um, it says, now... The multitude of those who believe were of one heart and soul. Of one heart and soul. The believers had the same purpose in life. 
And look at how this plays out, okay? Look at how this one soul, this one mind, this unity is expressed. In verse 32, continuing, it tells us, Now the multitude of those believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. No one claimed that it's his possession. All the people that were there, they weren't saying that, you know, no, you won't hear that from the church. This is mine. This is mine. Oh, you won't hear that from the people from the early church, the believers then. You won't hear them say, oh, this, this car is mine. Or, no, this camel is mine. <laughs> this bag is mine. This stuff, that, that, that's mine. You won't hear that. Because they know that it, it's not their own. It, God's own. It's Psalm 24. Um, oh, look at that. Where it says, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. They're all in one mind and one soul and one purpose, committed to one thing. It was a movement. It was one purpose. At the end of that, he said, you won't hear people say, what's mine is mine. Or what's yours is mine. You'll hear them say, what everything you see they're God. That's God. Psalm 24, one says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. That They believe that. Old Testament. They believe that. The early believers knew that. The things they had, it's not their own. It's God. If that's, if that's not God, don't answer it. Tell him I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be generous. You can ask him, I'm trying to be. <laughs> anyway, how about us? Do you have a job? Do you have a job? Do you, do you have a car? Do you have a house? Is that yours? Well, technically, yeah, it's, it's, it's yours, but... Ultimately, really, it's not yours. It's God. So don't let anything own you except God. Amen? Let me say that again. Don't let anything own you except God. Except God. Um, that's what you're probably saying. Well, you, you, are you saying that you can't own anything? Are you preaching that... Uh, Pastor Ron, I, I'm not preaching. I'm not against having things, having stuff. What I'm against is, and I'm preaching against being stingy or being, uh, being so selfish. If you know there are people who are in need, okay? And that, that's what I'm preaching about. You have compassion. Because here's what it is. In their oneness and in their unity, they the outflow that. And because they were, they were all following Christ and all preaching the same thing, the, the outflow is that is being generous. They are experiencing the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is, acting, is allowing them to, to, to become more generous. Um, it's important to see here, you know, that the apostles there, they weren't making any emotional appeals, right? I'm not going to make any emotional appeals either. They weren't asking people to give, but they were giving voluntarily. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, a preaching like this is not like um, uh, being an advocate of, of, you know, communism, put everything together and then we'll, we'll, everyone's going to be happy. No, no, no. Because in, in, in situations like that, you're being forced to, you're being forced to put your, uh, your possession yeah, but, but this one, they didn't even have to appeal, but they voluntarily gave. Voluntarily gave. Um, the key was that they listened to the Holy Spirit and responded when they saw that people were in need. Acts 33 says this. And with great power, everybody say great power. Great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. See, that's their goal. That's their purpose. That's, that's what they want to they proclaim. The goal is the gospel. Goal is the gospel. 
truly, we will only develop a generous heart when we realize that we are in this together, we're striving together for a common goal, and that's to proclaim the gospel. Look, that, look at the unity that was placed there. They were preaching the same thing. They were testifying with great power. They gave witness. They gave witness. But first of all, they have the power of the Holy Spirit. Testifying what? Testifying about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in death and then resurrected. Uh, Jesus Christ ascended, resurrected and then ascended. They all believed that. And that's what they were proclaiming. And that's what's in their mind. Christ was in their mind. Christ is foremost. Everything else falls second. So even in their possession, they know that Christ rules over that. Christ owns everything. I own nothing. I own nothing. That's why they were able to do the things they're doing. You see the word great power. Great power. That's the combination of the Holy Spirit. And remember the boldness that we talked about last week. They were bold enough, Peter and John, they were bold enough to, to stand before the Sanhedrin and proclaim. Even to, the, even to the Sanhedrin, even to the religious elite, the same thing. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's their message over and over and over. You'll see that, chapter 2, chapter 3. That's the same message. It's, it's because of the Holy Spirit that's in them and allowing them to, to have that boldness to proclaim it. Do you have this Holy Spirit in you? Do you have that boldness? Some of you have probably been stirred up last week when we talked about boldness, but I hope you didn't, you didn't, you didn't go out and just, just spoke about uh, about Jesus Christ, when you have that boldness, but you don't have the Spirit. Because uh, if you do that, then you're just going to be an obnoxious person. And God doesn't want you to be obnoxious. God wants you to be bold, and you'll get that if you have the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim, to proclaim His, uh, His name, to proclaim what He's done in your life. How many of you have... Uh, how many of you... Um, uh, felt that Maxine's testimony was powerful. Okay, for the rest of you, there's going to be a second testimony later on. Maxine will be. <laughs> but you know how powerful the testimony is. And that's because the power of the Holy Spirit in the end, there's a boldness for you to come out and tell people what happened in your life. Verse 33, God or the, the apostles gave witness. They gave their testimony. What did you say? Well, I don't know how to, you know, no, I don't know how to construct a testimony. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to share. I, I'm, I'm not well versed in the Bible just like you do. Well, can you open your mouth and just say what Jesus Christ has done in your life? Can you open your mouth and just, just tell them, you no, know, this is who I was before and now because I, I've met Christ, this is who I am now? Is there any change in your life that, that happened ever since you met Christ? Can you do that? They gave their testimony. The apostles did. And the apostles did and gave their testimony. It's good for them. It's good for us. Go on, be bold with the Holy Spirit and give your testimony. And, and, and always point to who? Jesus Christ. Not to yourself. Just point to Jesus Christ. They gave witness to Jesus Christ. They were talking about this for sure. They were talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we can have that kind of resurrection too. And that we can have the victory over grave because of Jesus Christ. See, the focus was with Christ who owns everything, even their very lives. Focus was Jesus Christ with what Christ has done. Being generous, even to the point of death, death on the cross. How can I think of myself now? How can I think of myself that Jesus Christ has given me that, that and poured out his love, poured out his grace to me? And that with Jesus Christ, I can be a, an heir of the inheritance. Boy, the richness that, that goes along with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. How can I think of this worldly stuff? How can I think of my possessions? Christ owns everything. And so I can be generous. 
When I put Christ first, I can be generous. It's like this. Uh, after I, I got back from the Philippines, I asked you to pray for me. And thank you for praying for me. Because uh, uh, when I came back from the Philippines, there was something that happened in my, <laughs> I'm pointing my head, not with my head, but with my, my ear. There's something wrong with my head, of course, but the, it's just with my ear now. <laughs> something happened with my ear. Uh, I came off the plane. It, uh, I couldn't hear. I had loss of hearing, and everything's muffled. All I can hear is myself, really, when I talk. Uh, and it's kind of difficult, you know, even when you drive, because you can't really hear the engine. Or, I thought I was driving a Tesla, because there's no... <laughs> but it was just a... I have to remind myself, it's a Honda. You know, anyway, uh, thank you for your prayers. Everything's gone now. I, I can hear about 98%. What was that? <laughs> no, no, 98%. 98%. Um, but last Monday, last Monday, when, when I was carrying my son Matthew from his wheelchair to his bat chair, uh, the Dolores... Everything was fine. Dolores uh, 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 um, bathed Matthew, and then I had to carry him back from the bath chair to the wheelchair. And after I put him in his wheelchair, I had my first ever attack of vertigo. My head started to spin. And it was a violent attack that... The, uh, any one of you experienced vertigo? This was a really serious vertigo because everything was spinning. I couldn't control. My, I lost my balance. I had to grab onto something. And it was dangerous and it was really scary. Everything that I see was just spinning around. And, and I, don't, I don't know where the floor was. I know where the ceiling was. I didn't have any kind of... I lost my equilibrium. I didn't have the, that kind of... Uh, th th that sense of where everything was. I had to grab on to, to, uh, to something. And uh, praise the Lord, I didn't, I didn't get into an accident. Um, but after that, I was afraid to drive. Um, I was afraid to work. No, I was afraid if I drill someone, I might be drilling all the way. Some of you don't know me. I, don't, I work in the dental office. I might be drilling the tongue instead of the two. So I couldn't hear the words. But here's the thing. You know, uh, I wasn't sure of myself. I was confused. Uh, then after a couple of days, it happened again. And it happened again and again and again. And here's how I maneuvered through all of those vertigo events. You know, when it struck, I, I quickly composed myself. I didn't panic. Just composed myself, kept calm. And with everything I see that's spinning around, I tried to focus on one thing. What, whether it be a clock on the wall, or whether it be a, uh, whether it be a dot on the wall, whatever it is, or a person, it would spin. But I tried to move my eyes and fix my eye on that one, one thing. And it what seemed to be like a minute on that first attack. When I tried, when I'm calm, and I try to just focus on one thing, I realized that it was only like about five to seven seconds. And now what I do is when I get that attack, I start counting, as I fix on an object, I start counting one, two, three, four, five. I was calm, even though the images spin. So I kept somewhat balanced. Same thing with our attitude on everything around us. You know, when we focus on all the things we have, when you're focused on all the circumstances in our lives, Lord, how can I give if I, you know, I, I, I already don't, I already lost my job. Oh, Lord, Lord, I, I'm, I'm really in a bind. Maybe I'll just pay back or maybe I'll just give when I'm really, really able. Uh, Lord, I don't have this X amount of saving in my bank account. Maybe when things get better, get a better job, then I'll, and I'll, and I'll give. 
uh, I can't serve, Lord, because I still got my kids to take care of, blah, 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 blah. No, you'll never have the grace and experience it until you let go of the things that, that own you. The early Christians knew that God owns everything. If you focus on God, everything else falls second. God owns everything. I own nothing. Second point I'd like to give you. Oh, we don't have a clock here, so I'm free to just move along. The second thing I'd like to, to share with you is uh, have an attitude from grace. Everybody say attitude. Everybody say grace. Grace. Look at verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Everybody say great grace. Great grace. He said a little while ago, great power. Great. Yes, when you have great power, then you experience the great grace. You got the power of the Holy Spirit, now you got the great grace coming along that. That's a byproduct of having great power of the Holy Spirit. Now you have a great grace. What does that mean? What does that mean? That's the grace of the gift of God given to you through Jesus Christ. How much he sacrificed. How much he has, uh, how much is given to, to, to purchase you. How much, how much he suffered. The grace of, is the gift of God given to you through Jesus. The early church had this, they were very generous. Because they have the favor of God. Grace is what gives us that, that, um, that necessary sort of like fuel to get through life. You won't be able to get through life if you don't have grace. Grace is everything. Grace is a means for your salvation. Grace is sufficient for all. Grace, is, uh, 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 grace gets you through the trials and tribulations in life. Everything falls on grace. Yeah, even the, the, the people don't believe in God. It's just by the grace that they're still alive, that they're still, that they're still breathing. Everything falls on grace. And this grace um, it comes from God. Um, if you don't have grace, then you have a weak grasp of life. You cannot throw, go, go through life without it. You better have grace. You better have grace. Or else you're going to have real difficulty in life. Real difficulty in life. You want to have grace? Yes. Let me hear you say it. I want grace. I want Let me hear you say it. I want more grace. I want more yes, grace. I, we want more grace. Leave it up. Say it one more time. I want grace. I want grace. Yes. And let me tell you how we can have that. How come the church, century church, how come those early believers had that great power and had that great uh, unity? And had that because of the grace that was poured upon them. They all, that, they all had this grace following them from God. Um, the context here is giving, inexplicable generosity. That's why they're experiencing grace. You know, they believe that Christ owned, God owns everything, even their very own lives. And because of that, they were becoming generous. And becoming, because of that, grace has been, has been coming out through their lives as well. Read verse 33 to 35. This is what it says. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. 35, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. <laughs> Am I asking you to, to sell all your possessions? Give all you got? <laughs> Give it to the poor? No, 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 I'm just asking you to look at what, what the first century believers' attitude was when the grace fell upon them. 
I want you to be envious about what they are doing. I want you to, to really know that, hey, this is a, a real authentic church because they were given to those who are in need. Um, I want you to experience the grace of giving. There's a great grace that flows through the life of a giver. Let me tell you one thing. I, I, I'm blessed, okay? I'm blessed. Because back in 1975, when some of you weren't born yet, <laughs> I was a worldly person and, and really not interested in God. But I'm glad someone shared with me the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm glad someone shared with me how, and told me how God really loved me. That I can have uh, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I asked him in my life, and, and, and something happened inside of me at that time back in 1975. Something happened in me. I can't explain it, but I've experienced it. I used to walk that way, and for some reason now, after I experienced the, 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 the gift of love and the gift of eternal life, I, I, the sins that I used to freely walk on, the things that I were doing that I used to love doesn't seem to appeal to me anymore. The, 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 Sure, it's still tempting me a little bit, but there's something that just skirts my, my feet off that track and goes somewhere else. And I get back to God. And he's suddenly saying, man, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that anymore. And when we talk about generosity, the things and the characters of God, even the generosity of, of, of God who gave his one and only son, that character of generosity should come out from your life because something happened. Once you accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. There's one passage in the Bible. I'd like you to see this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, 17. This is what it says by this. Let, let, let me hear it from you. For those of you who are close to the screen, uh, shout it out. Because those who are over 40 on this side, I mean, I see it. <laughs> I never hear it saying. Okay, John 3, 16, 17. By this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But whoever has this world's goods. And sees his brother in need. And shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God Abide in him. Because Jesus is in me now. How can I, how can I, I, I see someone who's, who's in need and not share with him the kind of love that I've received from, from God? It's all of Jesus' characters, all of Jesus' um, uh, uh, traits that should be flowing out from me. It should be coming out. Generosity is one of those things given to you because Jesus is now in you. So it should be coming out. It should be just a natural process that should come out. It shouldn't be a, a time when I should just stir you up. And, and then that's easy, actually. You say, you say a preaching like this and tell us an emotional story and then I'll get you stirred up. But if Jesus Christ is not really in you, yeah, you may give for a while, but it doesn't sustain you because it won't flow out naturally in your life. See, the grace that you really need to be generous comes from who? Point to the person. Point to the person who, who it comes from. It should come from God. Yeah, if you don't have that grace from God, generosity that you may show may be just momentary. Here's what I mean. Okay. <clears throat> my brother said, what time, how much time do I have? Oh, my goodness. Not that much time, but uh, let me show you. Let me just tell you this. I'm going to preach anyway. Yeah. My brothers and sisters are here from Chicago, okay? Now, why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand up and be, be acknowledged? Go ahead. My brother and my sisters. All right. That's, uh, that's Ramon right there. Uh, keep, keep standing, keep standing. I want, I want to embarrass you. That's Ramon. That's Mary Lou. And that's Gloria. Okay. Now, don't sit. Don't sit. Because I want people to look at your faces. I want people to look at your faces. Now, I know that we all look similar. 
came from the same mother, same father. <laughs> but if I were to ask you, if I asked you to guess, okay, which one among my relatives looks a lot like me? <laughs> Okay. Gloria. Uh, the, far right, everybody say far right. The, uh, raise your hand if you I look like Gloria, right on the far right. How about you say look like Ramon right here on the far le left side? How about Mary Lou? Okay. You know what? You probably say I don't like my wife is saying, you don't look like them. <laughs> you, don't look, you don't. You don't. They're more handsome and more beautiful than... But you know who among my relatives looks a lot like me? You know? It's Matthew. A <laughs> guapo, no? That's my son Matthew on his wheelchair. He's got my eyes. You know, he, he, he even has a mole on, uh, on the side of his neck. I don't know if you've noticed that. I, like me, same place. Same place. He likes to joke around. You can ask my wife. My, my, Matthew calls him Alice. Calls her Alice. When she's not around. Calls her mama when she's around. He even, he even, he even scratches his head like this. I didn't teach him that. But he scratches his head like this. This is so funny. When I, when I, when I see it, um, I see here's the point. It's the idea of wherever you are, whether you're in, whether, whether you're in your, whether you're in school, whether you're at work, whether you're at the supermarket, wh wherever you are, people should be able to point you out and say, this person is different. I, I, I think he's a Christian. People should, should see and know. Because you, you know why? Because you have Jesus Christ in you. And that should flow out from you. That's why we all have this discipleship groups going on every week, and you can see it. In the, that's not even complete. The ones in the bulletin, because we want you to we want you to be accountable and see it if you are really who you say you are. If, you, if if Christ is really in you, you're becoming one step closer to the image of God, and it should be obvious that you're. A child of God. Even in this generosity thing, it's should a character of Jesus that should be coming out. That's why it, this message is not about, I'm going to be generous. You know, after hearing this message, after coming to church, I'm going to be generous. No, 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 no. Because Jesus is in you. You slowly but surely gravitate to his character because he is in you. Because he's in you. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And if it's not doing to you, if that's not what the Holy Spirit is doing uh, uh, to you, then you might want to ask yourself, is, 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 am, I, am I really looking like, is Jesus Christ literally in, am I, Christian, really? In case in point, look at chapter 2, verse 8, to 1 to 4. I want you to read this, okay? And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord. 
Paul was saying, these people, they don't have every, they're in deep poverty. They were extremely poor, but yet they were asking, they were begging, they were pleading. Paul, allow us to give. Lord, also be generous. Give us that opportunity to give to someone in need. It's inexplicable. You're already down. And then you don't own anything, but still you want to have that opportunity to give. And they were what? They were uh, overflowing joy in extreme poverty. Overflowing with joy in extreme poverty. Think of it this, think of it this way. Okay, I want you to think of the most... Most generous person that you can ever think of. Okay, get that picture in your mind. That person. Don't tell the person next to you, okay? <laughs> How about thinking now, think of the most self-centered person, the most selfish person that you, that you can think of. Again, don't tell the person next to you, because he might be sitting next to you. <laughs> now, all right, now. now Look at this. Among the two, who's the miserable one? Yeah. Who's the most happy one? I mean, have you ever seen a, a, a have you ever seen a, a generous person that's an angry generous person? <laughs> it's, it's funny, but look. In the service, they're overflowing joy and extreme poverty. Overflowing joy and extreme poverty. When you have an opportunity to give, then you experience that. Then you experience that. That's the power of the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that allows them to give that, to be inexplicably generous. You get it? Yeah. Good. Good. Their focus is not on themselves, but on God. Oh, I've got so much to share, but, uh, but let me just quickly end with this one. Let me just say this, that uh, when you have Jesus, you become generous. That's why the goal here is not for you to Listen, the goal here, folks, as I said in the beginning, the goal here is not for you to give more. Really, my hope and prayer for you is to look into your own life. Look and see your, your life and look into your heart and see if you've ever received Christ. Because if Christ is there, it should be overflowing. With gratitude and with generosity. You know, my, my last trip in the Philippines, um, no, it was, it was great. I'll end up with this story and then I'm done. If you know me, I usually like to take my trip uh, with, with Butch and Dalia. They're, they're not here. But Butch and Dalia, the frequent milers, you know how frequent milers are? They fly like uh, five times a year and usually it's Asian over here, so you accumulate a lot of mileage. And with that comes along, um, it's expensive to fly. Right? And you fly like five times a year, six times a year. But with that, you get your mileage and you get benefits from that, right? You know, I'm getting vertigo again. And, and that's why I want to uh, fly with them. You know why? Because when I'm traveling with them, they got all these benefits. Sometimes they, they can have more bags than the usual uh, economy people like me. And my wife, so when we travel, we like to go with them because sometimes you can have 
some of our bags, you know, Butch, can you uh, t t take this extra bag for us? Now, Butch, a lot of people here will be watching you now. <laughs> but uh, that's just one benefit. Another benefit, you can just walk into the line, they give you first priority, you can check in your bags. Another, prior another benefit is that you can, and which I like, I enjoy, I like, we go to the lounge, the airline lounge, yeah? Just before the plane starts, you start relaxing there, and then you eat all the, the food that's available there, and they're usually a lot, a lot, a lot better than, 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 the air, than the airline, the flight, and the flight food. But when you're there, you start relaxing until they call your flight. Well, the last, uh, last uh, trip that we had, there were three couples, Butch, Dahlia, myself, Alice, and Sam and Freya. Where's Sam and Freya? Right there. Sam and Freya. We all went to the Philippines. Um, uh, so Butch and Dahlia went on our, they got their passes, the board passes, and they got their special uh, cards, I guess. Uh, and, and we just walked, walked along a lot of other people who were in line. We checked in our bags, and we were like walking, we were like, oh, yeah, we got this. Well, uh, we're, we're pretending that we're freak. I'm pretending now we're a freaking flyer. And so we got a bag check in, and so I got excited. We we're gonna go through the lounge and get our meals, and, you know. So we excitedly walked past other people, uh, got our bags checked, and then proceeded to the lounge. And while Butch was showing their special boarding pass and their membership cards, uh, right before you get into that lounge and enjoy a meal and stuff like that. Sam and Freya went after them next, and then me and my wife went next, and they suddenly stopped us, my wife and I. And they told us, Butch and Dada can only take two extra passengers, and we're the fifth and sixth one. And I was so embarrassed, because we were already there. And I, and I was looking around, other people are, are, are seeing our embarrassment, and I thought, I kind of felt embarrassed, and I kind of thought that, you know, here we are, my wife and I, we were walking along, and we got that swagger, you know, like rich people do that. You know, they put their heads up, and then they, they oh, just, just me, not my wife. You know, like you're a frequent flyer, a million miler person, and and then yeah, we 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 look rich, we act rich, we even smell rich. <laughs> you know, but we do, if we don't have that special card, then it invalidates everything. It invalidates everything. Sometimes in our lives, we can look really generous. We can act generous, even smell generous. But without a relationship with the Lord, we're missing something that's really essential. We're missing the God, the grace that can sustain that the grace that is sacrificial, the grace that allows you to see this other stuff, they don't matter. I, I can care less for the things that, that I have. My inheritance is in the Lord. I'm rich. It's the relationship, folks. It's the relationship. Paul says this really in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 says, For you know the great grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. We became he became sin for us so that we might have that righteousness of our Lord and that gift of grace that is free can be yours. It can be yours. 
he who accepts the Son gets the grace. Again, this is not a time to take from you, like I said. No, we, we want to give. want to give to you. This joy that we have, some of you, I've I, I seen it in your life, the joy that we have. And when you get it, like I said, all other things, this worldly stuff, doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. And this is what God wants to lead us to. Be inexplicably generous. May we bow and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, Lord. Those words are precious to us because they, they're a source of life. truth, Father, of your Son, Jesus Christ, the truth of your grace. And Father, I, I believe that there's an amazing thing that's happening here right now. I believe, that, Father, that it has just nourished us. I believe that it's going to sustain us. I believe that it's that something is increasing our faith. Father, in the last time together, the balance of this service convict us, Lord, and guide us into obedience. For some of you may be nodding yes during the during the message I can see that you're agreeing but there may be some here who may probably may not have really come to face face to face with with the God who owns everything Jesus Christ maybe all of these things are so alien to you the things that I'm saying this generosity thing but you're probably saying to yourself, but I, I, I don't understand, but I want that. How come it's only them that gets to get that blessing all the time? How come, how come I, I see it in other people's lives, but I don't see it in mine? Well, maybe the, the blessing that God wants to give you has been barred because you haven't really come to grips of who Jesus Christ is. He's the one who generously gave his life, walked on Calvary, suffered, was crucified, he died so that he can show you how much he loves you so that he can demonstrate that he can that you can be forgiven no matter how deep you are in your sin and just to prove that he resurrected from the grave and he's offering to you the greatest the greatest offer that the greatest person to ever live is offering to you the gift of grace and gift of eternal life through him so if that's you, may I encourage you to open up your heart and, and give God, give God your heart and your life. And it's a simple act of prayer. If you, if you want to pray right now and ask Him, come into your life just say a simple prayer of water in your heart simple prayer just like this you say Lord Jesus I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve eternal life but I believe you died and rose from the grave to 
purchase a place in heaven for me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Take control of my life, Lord. Forgive my sins and save me. I repent of my sins and I now place my trust in you. And I accept the, your grace, Lord, and the gift, the free gift of eternal life. Turn my broken life, Lord, into a testimony of your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, we commit the rest of this time to you. As we burst out in, in worship and telling each other and telling the whole world how great, wonderful, and generous, good God you really are. Praise your name. Everybody said, Amen. Let's all stand. Let's once again break.